Hey everybody, Maverick Christian here. I often end my videos inviting viewers to go in peace, serve the Lord, and love logic. In this video, I'm going to focus on that last category, last category and interview Liz Jackson, whom I contacted for an interview two days uh, after she finished her critical thinking ser series on her YouTube channel. It's a good series. I'll link to it in the description. Liz Jackson earned a PhD in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, thereby making me green with envy, <laughs> and is... Currently an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Ryerson University. Your primary research area is epistemology, or branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge, justification, and rationality. Fittingly, this interview will be about critical thinking. Liz Jackson, welcome to my humble internet abode. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. This is the first interview I've done on critical thinking, so I think it'll be really fun. <laughs> All right. So one tip for rational thinking I've noted is to remember that just because a belief is correct doesn't mean that the evidence will be in one sided completely in favor of it. In your dissertation, among other places, you distinguish between belief and credence. Could you describe what credence is and how evidence can change credence without necessarily changing belief? Yeah, absolutely. So I just first want to like register total agreement with your first point. I think many issues, especially controversial issues, there are good arguments on both sides, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that. You know, of course, if one person's saying P, the other person's saying not P, you know, only one position is correct. But the evidence can just be really difficult to assess. And so I think saying, you know, I think P is true, but there could be still be good evidence for not P. I think that's a really important thing to just say um, in life and in disagreements. So you asked about relationship between belief and credence. So yeah, this was actually my dissertation topic. Basically, what belief and credence are is there are two kind of mental states, two ways that we can view the world. So we can believe things. We can believe that it will rain tomorrow. Um, we probably you can, you can believe that one plus one equals two. And when it comes to belief, there's basically three main attitudes you can take towards like a statement or a proposition. So you can believe it, you can disbelieve it, or you can withhold belief. So if you believe it, you're saying it's true. If you disbelieve it, you're basically saying it's false. And then you could withhold belief where you're sort of not taking a stand either way. So I withhold belief on, you know, whether there's an even number of hairs on my head, for example. I'm, I'm not taking a stand either way on that. Um, but notice, so, okay, I believe that, let's say it will be sunny tomorrow. And I believe that one plus one equals two. But my attitude towards those two statements isn't exactly the same. You know, I'm more confident that one plus one equals two, then that it will be sunny tomorrow. The weather forecast could be wrong. There could, you know, rain could come in at the last second, you know, whatever. And so because of this, a lot of epistemologists think that this belief withholding disbelief story, it can't be the full picture. So they also appeal to another attitude um, that's similar to like levels of confidence. They often call it credences. And so credences are a much more fine grained attitude where Basically, how probable some proposition is, is modeled on a scale from zero to one. One is maximal confidence, 100% certainty that something's true. And then zero is, you know, 100% certainty that it's false. And then you can have credences all the in between. So, you know, I probably have a credence of really close to one that one plus one equals two. Whereas my credence that it will be sunny tomorrow might be like 0.9 or something. And then my credence that I have an even number of hairs would be like 0.5. So... My dissertation was kind of about the relationship between these two attitudes. And I think one thing that you said that I think is really important to notice is sometimes we could believe something and continue to believe it, even when we get evidence against it, that, that evidence might move our credence down a little bit, but nonetheless, we can rationally continue to believe that thing. So one example that they'll give is, again, we can just go with the weather thing. I check the weather, let's say this time instead, it says it's going to rain tomorrow, there's a 90% chance of rain. So I believe it's going to rain tomorrow, and I also have a 0.9 credence that it will rain tomorrow. And then, maybe a few hours later, I check the weather again, now there's only an 80% chance of rain. I can continue to believe that it's going to rain tomorrow, it's still very likely that it will rain tomorrow, but I should move my credence from 0.9 to 0.8. So sometimes evidence can move our credences around without changing our beliefs. And I think this is really interesting. One reason I think it's interesting is I think it's actually a way that you could have faith that's rational, but go beyond the evidence. You can acknowledge I get evidence against this thing I believe or this thing I'm committed to, but you know, your credence goes down, but you can kind of continue to believe or continue to, to have that commitment. 
All right. And for more on that, you can read, I think it's chapter six of your dissertation where you discuss that. <laughs> I am amazed that you know that. That's awesome. Yes, it is chapter six of my dissertation. Um, it's actually, it's also a paper in religious studies. It's called Belief, Credence, um, and Faith. Um, and I also actually also have a video on my YouTube channel about it too. But I love that you know that that was my dissertation chapter six. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and one thing to note, because this kind of messed me up too, is that uh, Credence isn't necessarily completely like confidence and belief. Because I also think you remember, you mentioned in your dissertation how Maybe you can have credence without having belief. I think he used dogs as uh, scraps on the table. Can you kind of describe that? I'm trying to remember the case that you're talking about. So I think it was like, like dogs. So a dog might, uh, somebody did gives the dog scraps like, you know, tons of times, like maybe 90% of the time. And the other person mm -hmm. only does like, you know, maybe 60% of the time. I don't remember the exact numbers. But the dog will kind of instinctively go to the person, the 90% without having that belief. Oh, this, mm. this person has a 90% belief, 90% chance of giving me table scraps. Yeah, sorry. Now, mm. I, now I know what you're talking about. Yes. So this is a case where it seems like the dog's like maybe more confident that you'll feed him than that I will feed him potentially, right? But um, it wouldn't, it seems weird to say that the dog has a belief about a probability. So the dog doesn't have the concept of probability. The dog's not forming probability beliefs. Um, the dog just has this, this kind of confidence level, right? So um, so it's actually part of what this case is supposed to do is argue against this view that says we don't have credences, all we have is just beliefs about probabilities. And it's supposed to say, no, sometimes children and animals, they could have credences or have confidence levels, but not have the corresponding belief about probabilities. So yeah, I think it's, it's kind of an interesting case to think about. Yeah, I gotta mention that because when you mentioned like a belief first and credence first, I thought it's like, well, isn't it obvious that it's belief first? And then you explain, oh, okay, so credence isn't exactly how I thought it was initially. Mm. So in, in critical thinking video four, uh, you talked about putting arguments in standard form, numerically listing clearly stated premises with the conclusion being on its own line. My own experience has found that to be tremendously useful, for example, in mitigating the risk of red herring objections, particularly when I ask someone which premise is false or unjustified. Can you describe any of your experiences and how the standard form has helped you? Yeah, definitely. So I think there's sort of two cases where I think it's really helpful. Um, the first is when you're trying to either make an argument or like figure out why you believe something. And I think when you put your arguments like in your own head <laughs> in standard form, I think it, it becomes really clear, like, what is the exact conclusion I'm trying to argue for? And then what are the specific reasons or support for that conclusion? And I think this can help you kind of say, do I really have a good reason for the things I'm believing just as, at a very basic level? It can also help uncover like hidden assumptions that you might have. Um, you can see like what premises you've defended or have good reasons for and then what premises you haven't defended. And I also think this is really helpful too in discussion or dialogue with other people. So I have you know, papers where what I've actually literally done is said, here's my conclusion and here's my premises and this is my paper, right? Uh, and then you, you spend the paper sort of defending the premises and then you're in this Q and A session. This happens a lot in philosophy conferences that people like to kind of come at you really intensely with all these objections. And then you're like, okay, which premise are you denying? Which premise? Like the argument is valid. So which premise, you know, are you, are, you know, are you challenging? And I think you're exactly right that this can really bring out whether it's actually a good objection to the argument or if it's just a red herring or it's like some other thing that maybe is relevant to the conclusion but isn't actually relevant to your argument for that conclusion. So I think it's super, super helpful kind of in dialogue with other people and figuring out like, why you actually disagree, and if you're even actually disagreeing at all. Um, another thing I think can happen too is that sometimes someone's making an argument and someone is objecting to a premise, but then halfway through the discussion, they switch and start objecting to a different premise, you know? And, and that's fine. You can object to different premises, but it's important to realize that that's what you're doing. Um, so maybe I'll give a quick example of this. So maybe you're, someone's trying to argue that drugs should be illegal. And um, they might give an argument like this. Premise one, drugs harm the drug user. Premise two, if drugs harm the drug user, then drugs should be illegal. So drugs should be illegal. And notice 
You would argue against each of these premises in very different ways. So the idea that drugs harm the drug user has a lot to do with like what is in the drug, the biological effects of drugs, you know, how the drug makes people feel. Um, you know, it's almost more of like an empirical claim. Whereas the question of, you know, if dr drugs harm the user, then drugs should be illegal. Well, that's a totally different question. That's about like, should the government be paternalistic and be, you know, involved in people's lives, even if they're not harming someone else, you know? So there's like kind of moral or but more like legal, maybe some moral stuff involved in this. So it's much less about whether drugs are harmful and more about like whether the government should protect us from ourselves. So I think if, you know, if someone was making an argument that drugs should be illegal, I think it's really important to distinguish between these two things because you would argue for them in very different ways and you would object to them in very different ways, too. Yeah, it's a good point about how uh, logically valid arguments are useful in dialogue. I've seen uh, William Lane Craig debates. One of the things I really like about him is that he presents his arguments kind of like a logically format, logically valid format a lot of the times, which is great. I mean, he kept basically... I kind of, kind of think how Elephant Planting had taught me how to think like a philosopher. William Lane Craig taught me how to debate like a philosopher mm -hmm. because even if you disagree with Craig, you at least see where he's coming from, clearly see his reasoning. Yeah, and it's super clear and simple, and usually it's just like a simple modus ponens, or I think one of the ones he does will be like A or B or C, not B, not C, therefore A. You know, it's these simple argument forms. Um, and, you know, in some ways... He's, he's making himself easier to object to because you can just say, here's the premise that's false. It's not kind of this jumbled mess, but it's actually a lot more intellectually honest, I think. And I think we're going to talk about this later too, but I think it helps us all get closer to the truth when we're just really clear about the argument we're making and the reasons for it. Yeah. And critical thinking video six, you invoked a principle that is evidently rank heresy among those who argue on the internet. And that principle is the principle of charity. How does implementing this principle illustrate how the goal between winning a debate and finding the truth can potentially conflict? Perhaps start with uh, reminding everyone what the principle of charity is. Yeah, so the principle of charity has to do with um, argument reconstruction. So, you know, you're reading a text, or you're watching a speech, and you're trying to figure out what argument is this person making? And like we just talked about, I strongly encourage you to put it in standard form. You put the premises on their own lines, you number them, and then you list the conclusion at the end. Um, and so one principle that I teach my students and I think is just good to use in general is the idea that when we're reconstructing someone else's argument and we're putting it in standard form, we want to try to make it as strong as possible. And note, too, that I do think it's, it's important to keep the author's intentions in mind as well. So I also talk about what I call the principle of faithfulness, which says you want to stay true to the author's intentions. So you want to make it as strong as possible without just like totally changing the subject and, you know, doing something that they clearly, giving an argument they didn't, they clearly didn't intend to make, you know. Um, but part of the reason I think the principle of charity is so important is because I think like, look, like, why do we in the end even have these like controversial discussions? Like, what's the point of it all? And I think one of the main reasons to have them is to get at the truth. It's to get more evidence for and against these important positions. Um, and it's to, to make your beliefs more true, more accurate. Um, and so if we're focusing on this goal of getting at the truth, then I think we're going to be less concerned with things like just making ourselves look good, making the other person look bad. But we want to figure out, has this person that I'm in dialogue with provided good reasons or good evidence for their conclusion? And that's important because if they have, then you should increase your confidence. You should increase your credence in, in their conclusion. Um, but, you know, we want to make their argument as strong as possible to try to figure out, is this actually a good reason? Um, and this is part of the reason why, you know, I think dialogue can be useful. And I think even to some extent, debates can be good. But I think we need to be careful that we don't overly focus on, like, who's looking better or who sounds more convincing to me. With, without thinking about who's actually giving good reasons or evidence, or how can I learn from this? How can I get closer to the truth? So when people are like, oh, who won? Or like, you know, who's a better, who uses better rhetoric? I think that can sometimes distract from what I hope our ultimate goal is, which is finding the truth. So one, one place where I think the principle of faithfulness is going to be uh, less useful is uh, something called steel manning, Mm -hmm. where you actually try to improve upon the argument and, and attack it. 
Mm. So I mentioned earlier about how Open Planet taught me how to think like a philosopher. I read this book many years ago, and I liked how his approach was, is like he knocked down a certain version of the problem of evil, or argument from evil, and then he's like, okay, but we can repair it by, by fixing this, and then he attacks that, and it's like, well, that doesn't work so well, but we can repair it by doing this, and then he attacks, it's like, that is brilliant. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I think the biggest thing would maybe just... You know, you don't want to say this is the argument this person is making when it's actually really a totally different argument. So I think you could maybe say, here's a way we could improve this argument or or whatever. But maybe then we're just not we're not doing argument reconstruction anymore. We're kind of like you said, like steel manning or something. So so I totally I totally agree that that's really valuable. And I, and I like when people do that as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's just if we're reconstructing someone else's argument, we also don't want to say this is their argument when it's not. So I, th- I think we, we we agree there. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things I um, okay, and in, in, crit- in your critical video, thinking video seven, you talked about cheap validity, an idea that I had in my mind prior to watching your critical thinking series, but I've never seen someone put a name to it before. Uh, so, what is cheap validity, and what practices can one use to implement the principle of charity beyond cheap validity? Yeah. So, cheap validity is this idea. So, maybe I'll just say very quickly. A valid argument is a valid, an argument in which if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. So the premises like necessarily support the conclusion. Um, and I have a whole video where I talk about like valid argument forms and I go into all this more in more detail. So if you're not familiar with validity, you should check that out. Um, and, and the idea behind cheap validity is that you can actually take any argument and you can always make it valid by adding a like linking premise. And basically a premise, a linking premise would say something to the effect of, you know, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. So you can actually take an argument where the premises and the conclusion seem totally unrelated and then just add this linking premise to make it valid. So if I say it's Saturday, so God exists, you know, my premise, it's Saturday, my conclusion, God exists. Well, that's like totally an invalid argument. But you could, in theory, make that valid by adding a premise. If it's Saturday, then God exists, right? I mean, that premise is going to be clearly false, but at least you've kind of made my argument valid. So what I suggest to my students is that when we're reconstructing someone else's argument, to err on the side of making it valid. Um, You know, maybe there are cases where someone's just blatantly making an invalid argument. Okay, that's one thing. But I think people, we should err on the side of, of making our opponent's arguments valid. Um, one, because I think sometimes when people make arguments, they do have implicit premises, things that they're sort of assuming in the background that they're not explicitly saying. Um, but also, I think making your opponent's argument valid is just a more charitable thing to do. And once you make it valid, then you can point out, like, this premise is just blatantly false. You know, if, if it's Saturday, then God exists. Like, no, that is just not true, right? Um, but I think it's interesting because sometimes when you, you set up the argument and make it valid, you know, that linking premise might not be as implausible as you thought. You, you kind of need to test it out. So you might be surprised. Um, so you also ask, like, what are some practices we can use to implement the principle of charity beyond just cheap validity? So I think there's like two things I want to mention here. Um, the first is just trying to make your opponent's premises plausible. If there are multiple different candidates for what your opponent's premise might be, then pick the one that's the most plausible. Um, we talk about this when we're talking about like generalizations. So, um, you know, don't pick a really wide, broad generalization if it's a super implausible claim. Um, so that's that's one thing I, I talk about a little bit in the video when I give some examples. Um, and then another thing to do is think really a lot about the conclusion that you're attributing to your opponent. Um, you can actually make it too strong. And if you make the conclusion too strong, then the premises aren't going to support it. But that's not that's just because you're wrong about what their conclusion is. So I think, you know, you kind of want to balance here. You don't want to make their conclusion so boring that it's just trivial or something that everyone agrees with. But I also think you want to ask yourself, is this really what they're arguing for? Or are they arguing for something interesting, but but maybe a little bit weaker? So I think those are sort of two other ways we can be charitable when we're reconstructing arguments. Yeah, one bit of advice I would like to give is to resist the temptation to interpret your opponent in the worst possible way. Even though that might be rank heresy on the internet, that's generally yeah. a good idea. I agree with that for sure. 
Now, one of the things I mentioned in vlog episode nine in my channel is that just because a view is incorrect does not mean that every objection against it is a good one. And just because a view is correct doesn't mean that every argument in favor of it is a good one. In her critical thinking video eight, you have something similar as well as other tips for evaluating and making objections to arguments. What are some good tips that you can offer on this subject? Yeah, absolutely. So I think keeping like both of those things in mind is really, really important. Um, so first of all, I think just because you agree with some arguments conclusion doesn't mean you should accept that argument. There can be really bad arguments for true conclusions. So you say that's a that's a good conclusion, so I must accept the argument. No, like don't do that. And I think people that do that all the time, there's probably there can sometimes even be a little bit of intellectual dishonesty there. Um, you know, if I say like, you know, I'm a theist and then I give this argument, the moon is purple. If the moon is purple, then God exists, therefore God exists. Like yeah, I agree with that conclusion, but I should say that's a terrible reason to believe in God. You know, that's not a good argument. Um, so I think for almost any conclusion, you can come up with a bad argument for it with a bad reason to believe it. Um, but on the other hand, I think especially when it comes to kind of controversial issues that are sort of these live debates and, you know, it seems like there's reasonable people on both sides. In these situations, I think there's often going to be good arguments for both sides. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important to recognize, especially when it comes to controversial issues, there can be good arguments for positions that you disagree with. Um, and like we talked about for, with the very first question, if you, if you encounter a good argument for a position you disagree with, maybe you should lower your confidence. Um, you know, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot. But sometimes I think it's, it's reasonable to keep holding that previous position you held because maybe you think this is a good argument for a position I disagree with. But I think there's even better arguments for the position that I agree with. And just um, to clarify, by good argument, you don't necessarily mean sound argument. You yeah. mean like an, an argument that gives like a non-zero amount of evidential support for the position, right? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a good clarification. So it would be an argument that's valid. And then there's at least some evidence for the premises. You know, I'm not saying it's necessarily overwhelming evidence, but um, it's, it, you know, it's an important consideration. It's a good thing to think about. There's It gets, gives some evidential weight, you know. Um, so. You know, I don't think, I guess the main point here is it's not inconsistent to hold a position, but admit that there are good arguments in this sense um, for the other side. You know, they have some evidence in favor of them. Um, and I think, too, I think it, it is good to have epistemic humility and not just not be overly confident, especially about our controversial views. I think we can still be confident about a lot of controversial things, but I, I see a lot of overconfidence. So I think Sometimes we should say that's a good argument and then maybe lower our credence or our confidence a little bit. I liked how you in your uh, critical thinking series, you talked about attacking a premise of a valid argument when evaluating and critiquing an argument. That made me fall in love with the series right there, just because <laughs> sometimes when I like I dialogue on the Internet, I introduce a logically valid argument. It's like, OK, so this seems like a good argument. To so what do you think about it? And it is so common that I see people not attack any premise of the argument. They give more yeah. like a general response or yeah. just try to attack the conclusion. And sometimes even when I specifically ask, OK, but if you think the argument's unsound, which premise is false? A lot of, sometimes they just dodge a question left and right. It yeah. hurts me to no end. <laughs> no, totally. I think, too, another thing people don't realize is if I give you an argument for some conclusion, giving your own argument that the conclusion is false it's not that that's irrelevant, but you're just not interacting with my argument. You know what I mean? So it's like, if I give you an argument, God exists, and then you're like, but there's evil. How could God exist? It's like, okay, it's not saying that's an irrelevant consideration. But if the point of this is to be talking about the argument I just gave, you're not doing that. You're, you're changing the subject and talking about a different argument. So I think it's important to remember that. And again, this is why standard form is so important, because then you can say, well, which premise are you denying? Yeah. Another way to think about it is that for a logically valid argument, the premises, if we know them to be true, constitute evidence for the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so by ignoring the premises, one is ignoring the proffered evidence. And that's just yeah. not good critical thinking to yeah. simply ignore, deliberately ignore contrary <laughs> evidence to your position. Yep. Yeah, you don't need a PhD in philosophy to recognize that. <laughs> Even a lonely undergraduate student such as myself can get that. <laughs> All right, so what are some of your favorite fallacies to hate? Yeah, I actually love that you asked about this um, because I didn't actually do a video about fallacies. I might, do, I might do one later. 
Um, but I think fallacies are a really interesting thing. So as you probably know, but maybe your viewers don't all know, there's kind of two main types of fallacies. There's formal fallacies, which basically says your argument is of an invalid form. Um, and I talk about some of these in some of my videos. So affirming the consequent or denying the antecedent, those are invalid forms. It means the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. So that's like a formal or like a logical fallacy. Um, then there's also informal fallacies, which is your reasoning is bad, but it's not because of the logical structure of your argument. It's it's for some other reason. Um, so I think that's an important distinction. Um, I think some some fallacies are are really important and really helpful to know about. And one book you actually asked me about some books, so maybe I'll uh, you know preview part of my response to that. So Daniel Kahneman has this book, and it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't know if you've read it, but it is an amazing book. And one thing I love about it. As he, he studies psychology, but he shows there are certain fallacies that we tend to fall into, and he gives these really compelling examples of them. And I think, honestly, it just totally changed the way that I think reading that book. So I highly recommend that book to everyone. But some of the fallacies he talks about, one is the base rate fallacy. So when we're, you know, making assumptions or assigning probabilities, we don't think about the base rate. We just think about some piece of evidence that's like immediately available to us. Um, another one is called the, the conjunction fallacy, which sometimes, so a conjunction would be A and B. And um, if you have a conjunction, as long as A or B are not logical truths, it's always going to be less probable than one of its conjuncts. But sometimes if A and B seem like explanatorily related, then we tend to think that A and B is more probable than just one or the other. So I'll give a quick example of this because I think it's fun. So they they did a study where they had people, I think they were ranking statements in probability. And so they say, you know, Linda was this woman studies major, very passionate about feminism and women's rights. She majored in, you know, women's studies, went to rallies, all this stuff. Um, after she graduates from college, which is more likely. And then the first option was like, Linda is a bank teller. The second option was Linda is a bank teller who's active in the feminist movement. And <laughs> A lot of people said option two was more likely, given sort of this backstory, this background evidence about Linda. Um, but option one is actually logically weaker than option two. So option two should just trivially be more likely. Or sorry, option one should just be trivially more likely. So I think this is, it's a really interesting fallacy. It's called the conjunction fallacy. And the Kahneman book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks a lot about both the base rate fallacy and the conjunction fallacy. So those are those are two of the ones I think are super interesting and I think change change the way that I think about a lot of things. Um, but maybe I'll say one one thing about this. I think when it comes to fallacies, at the same time, I think we need to be careful um, because some, especially informal fallacies that I've heard on the internet, I think are just total nonsense. <laughs> um, so here's two examples, and I think. Um, I typed in like fallacies to Wikipedia and both of these were on the Wikipedia page for fallacies. So they're definitely out there. Um, okay, one is appeal to authority. So it's supposed to be a fallacy if you say like, the experts say P, so that's evidence for P or something. Um, that is not a fallacy. Like an expert consensus is actually a really good reason to believe something. So that fallacy I think is nonsense. Another one that I've heard and that was on the Wikipedia page is like appeal to probability. So uh, P is highly probable, so that's, you know, P is true or something. Uh, well, it's good to accept highly probable things, right? So I don't know. So, so I think just when it comes to fallacies, like they're very important and, and very interesting, but also be careful because I think some of the popular fallacies are actually not examples of bad reasoning. I remember the uh, appeal to authority is a little bit more nuanced. In some cases, it's fallacious. In some cases, it's clearly not. Mm. So like if you, for example, what one bad appeal to authority I think would be, for example, all right, what do, what percentage of philosophers believe in P? Well, pretty much everything in philosophy is controversial. So maybe, <laughs> so yeah. maybe that wouldn't be a good one. Unless it's some sort of like really incontrovertible truth in philosophy, like, um, oh, is uh, like, you know, something in set theory, for example, or whether modus ponens is a valid rule of inference. Mm -hmm. Something really uncontroversial. Yeah, there can be definitely... Certainly appropriate appeals to fallacy, uh, uh, appropriate uh, appeals to authority, like when you're doing expert consensus and say science. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I've never heard of the uh, fallacy of appealing to probability. That seems like a word. I'll have to check. I'll have to check that out after this interview. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's one of those things that most people don't really take seriously, but I have heard it before, and I was just like, "What?" So just because maybe here's a rule of thumb: just because something is labeled a fallacy uh, doesn't mean you should just believe that it's a fallacy, even if it has like a fancy name. So, um, so yeah, I think you know, with expert consensus, it is tricky, but I think. In a lot of cases, if there is somewhat of an expert consensus on something, at the very minimal, I think that's some level of evidence for it. Maybe it's not good evidence or decisive evidence, or you know, maybe that doesn't mean you should believe that thing. But I do think it counts as as some kind of evidence. So, um, so yeah, just be careful with with fallacies, I guess. <laughs> I do remember at least one fallacy that wasn't really a fallacy called the hypostatization fallacy. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. No. What is uh, it? <laughs> it's the fallacy of treating something as abstract as something concrete. But it, but every example I hear is just basically someone who doesn't understand figures of speech, apparently. So <laughs> yeah. a, an example would be like, well, science says that this vaccine works. It's like, oh, that's a hypothesize. Science isn't like a concrete thing that says something. Well, yeah, but it's metaphorical about what the scientific evidence suggests. It's It's, it's not literal. Yeah, that seems super silly. (laughs) Um, I think this person just needs to understand, like, what non-literal speech is. (laughs) So I'm with you on that one. And uh, one fallacy I love to hate is the red herring fallacy. I talked about that in blog episode Mm -hmm. eight. I was glad your critical thinking video eight eight video where in tip three, you recommend directing criticisms at individual premises. Like, Like I mentioned before, it's. It's amazing how often people don't do that, at least at least in, in practice. I get irritated when people do that. They just dodge the question. So, yes, again, yeah. very glad you, you kept that because that's a very popular way to have a, like a red herring fallacy. It's like they make sometimes they make an objection. I can just point out it's like, OK, that may be true, but that objection doesn't attack any premise of the argument. So yep. do you have an objection against the premise of the argument? It's, it's amazing how <laughs> common red herring fallacies can be on the Internet, even if you put your argument in standard form. I see them in philosophy, too. I definitely see them in philosophy. So, you know, I think that that's a really common one. And yeah, I think this is why just yeah, using standard form and critical thinking and being clear. I mean, sometimes philosophers don't even do that. So so I think it's something it's something we can all get better at. <laughs> yeah. So even if philosophers are less likely to make a fallacy, it doesn't necessarily may mean they won't. I've, I've seen it happen before. I'm kind of surprised, too, because this, hey, these people are, should be smarter than I am in regards to philosophy. But even philosophers are human, apparently. Yeah, totally. Totally human. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So any good logic or critical thinking books you recommend? I know you've mentioned Richard Feldman's Reason and Argument in one of your videos, but that appears to be out of print nowadays. Yeah, so I did actually use Reason and Argument for my class, but it is out of print. But I have a copy of it. If you want to copy um, someone listening to this, you can shoot me an email and I'd be happy to send you that. Um, but here's a couple that I recommend. So one I mentioned already is Daniel Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow. I think this is just, it's just one of, it's such a great book. So I, I really recommend it to people. Um, a lot of it's psychology, but it really helps you see like actual fallacies that people really do make all the time and, and has really like, instructive and helpful examples and I think it really it it changed the way I think and it changed like a lot of patterns of reasoning that we see all the time it helped me say it's actually not a good pattern of reasoning so I I highly recommend that book I think I could be wrong but I think there's a free audiobook on YouTube so google that Um, another common critical thinking book that a lot of people use that is not out of print is called the power of critical thinking by Vaughn so if you want um, a critical thinking book, maybe similar to the Feldman one, but that is still in print, um, that's one I can recommend. So that's called The Power of Critical Thinking. Um, okay, so if you're more interested in like logic-y stuff, um, I have two recommendations for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first is more introductory. So it's Nelson Lond called Classical Logic in Its Rabbit Holes. I've seen many, many philosophers that use this in their like logic classes. Um, but it, it doesn't, you know, it has the basic stuff, but it also goes beyond that somewhat as well. So that would be a little more introductory. If you're maybe more advanced, maybe you, you know, you have a degree in philosophy or you're in grad school or you've just been thinking about this stuff for a while. Um, a book that I see quite a bit is Cider's um, Logic for Philosophy. Uh, I actually did an independent study in logic and that was the book that we used. So that's maybe more of like a graduate level book, but it's really good. So again, that's Cider Logic for Philosophy. 
Um, and then the last book that I want to recommend is about probability theory. So we were talking about credences at the beginning, but I think probability theory is actually a really important part of just learning to reason well, learning about epistemology. And so Mike Teitelbaum has a book, and it's called The Fundamentals of Bayesian Epistemology. And it's pretty accessible, um, especially, you know, the first couple chapters, I think really most people could understand them. So I think if you Google the fundamentals of Bayesian epistemology, I think you could probably find a PDF of it. I think he's put it out there. I don't know if he's done with it yet. Last I checked, he had written the first 10 chapters. But that's a really great sort of intro to probability theory book that I would highly recommend. So actually, if you want, maybe I could send you that list and you could like put it in the show notes or something, because if people weren't taking notes, that's probably a lot to remember. So I agree. And I can firsthand authority <laughs> that this is definitely not for beginners. Yeah, it's, it's like really good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's not for beginners. I'm lucky that I took some logic before reading that book, because otherwise it'd be like, yeah, I know. And it's surprising, but it is actually like one of the clearest ones. Um, logic is just hard, especially advanced logic. It's, you know, it's tough. So but yeah, the advanced I mean, I stuff think, is yeah. really hard. I remember I took a, a graduate level logic course where he talked about like a uh, completeness and, and soundness, how you can actually prove that it's something that's complete and sound propositional logic. And I was like, yeah. oh man, this is like, I, I feel like I'm an advanced math course. Yeah, no, it gets super mathy. And I just remember like I, I had to, I took logic first year of grad school, just sitting sitting with my classmates trying to figure out proofs for like five or six hours like it's I mean it gets really intense but it's good to know I mean it's helpful background although I think probably once you're getting to the cider level that's not stuff that you'll probably be using for just like really basic like argument evaluation stuff but it's more like you're doing logic because you like logic so yeah that's, that's pretty much kind of what I, I started doing that because you know I want to get a graduate degree in philosophy someday and it seems like something like that is good to know yeah, right, for so, sure. Uh, any last words before we go off? Anything you want to promote? So, for example, I heard a rumor you had a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, I do have a YouTube channel. Um, I think if you do youtube.com slash user slash Liz Jackson 111, it should pop up. So I have a playlist on critical thinking, which is obviously what we've been talking about. I also have an epistemology playlist and I have some stuff on my research and talks I've given and I'm planning to, you know, continue to to make videos through for that this summer. So definitely um, check that out. I guess another thing too um, is just my website. So it's liz-jackson.com, and um, I have like a research page. So if you're more interested in like my dissertation or academic articles, you can check that page out. Um, and then I also have a page public philosophy, and so that's just a place where I have other video interviews I've done podcasts, some blog posts, kind of more more popular level stuff on my work. So those are, I think, the best places to find me. All right. Uh, I guess this will about wrap it up. This is Maverick Christian inviting you to go in peace, serve the Lord, and love logic.